What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 233 at block height 643,879, Saturday, August 15th. So, what is up, Janine? Well, I am just admiring this amazing story about a bald eagle who attacked a government drone on Thursday. Seems like American patriotism is making a comeback. Yeah, actually, the first thought that went through my head is that um, if Marty is uh, represented by an owl, then I call dibs on this drone-killing bald eagle. That, that seems fair. <laughs> so for anyone who hasn't seen this story, I want to actually quote from it. Um, this was, I think, NBC News? Yeah. Uh, a Bald Eagle took down a government drone in Michigan, state officials said Thursday. The bird of prey attacked the Phantom 4 Pro Advanced Squadcopter drone about 162 feet in the sky on July 21st. Oh, this is from... This was not this past Thursday. It was actually last month. Anyway, it does not affect how awesome it is. Um, tearing off a propeller and sending the aircraft to the bottom of Lake Michigan, according to the State Department of... Uh, environment great lakes and energy the attack could have been a territorial squabble with the electronic foe or just a hungry eagle the department said an environmental quality analyst and drone pilot hunter king was mapping shoreline erosion on lake michigan with the device which was flying at 22 miles per hour when it began twirling out of control and he spotted an eagle flying away a bird watching couple that was nearby said it saw said they saw the eagle strike something and appear to fly away uninjured uh, a search for the drone days later was unsuccessful. The device was 150 feet offshore in about four feet of Lake Michigan water. Boom! Go anti-surveillance drone bird. Oh, I'm seeing, I'm seeing whole, whole, um, you know, continuations of this. You know, you, you can actually go on YouTube and learn how to do an eagle call. And if you do it right, they'll, they'll actually come. Like, it's me and my buddies fuck around when we go hiking and do that all the time. And uh it always freaks one of them out because he thinks they're going to come attack us. But uh if we ever get to the point where there are omnipotent drones everywhere, I mean, just make an eagle call. Have them deal with it. <laughs> well, there, uh, I did see people suggesting that uh, we should possibly be training um, eagles or falcons to actually attack these drones on purpose. I think, you know, they might just do it. If you just get them around the same area, hey, what's that thing doing? This is my hunting ground. But yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. The that funny is thing just... is, I think I think there was actually a documentary, um, National Bird, about drone warfare. So, yeah, get the, the actual national bird to be anti-surveillance. I mean, it's just something incredibly poetic about that with everything going on right now like there there really is <laughs> what is going on right now well to slide into things um it's a very sad day on the 14th of august so uh <clears throat> all of us degenerates knew that this day was coming it was inevitable that there was no way this wasn't going to happen. Bitmax has announced that starting August 28th, they are going to start instituting KYC ID checks, and they will give users six months until February 12th of 2021 um, before this becomes mandatory. And, um, yeah, 
this is the legit end of an era, folks. Um, <laughs> and uh, really, I, I don't even know where to start. Um, obviously, like uh, DGENs are going to be flooding everywhere looking for a new place with a uh, 100x degenerate leverage to trade on. But, uh, you know, this to me just is an interesting fundamental signal in the sense that this happens right when we actually start making up moves and trending towards what looks like a bull market and this happens because the u.s government has really wanted to screw these guys for years like people who don't trade um like this is one of the most liquid exchanges in this entire ecosystem like for massive stretches of time this is where the trading volume went and it actually pushed spot market around because of the arbs that a lot of people did between them like this was arguably and probably will still remain so one of the most important exchanges and markets in this entire ecosystem and it's a very open secret wink that shit tons of Americans illegally trade on this with no KYC through VPNs on a regular basis, um, despite being completely banned and it being totally illegal for private American citizens to trade here. And the instant we start going up, oopsies, sorry, here comes the KYC guys. So um, yeah, this tells me that in this market side or cycle, <clears throat> they are legitimately worried about the dollar amounts of Bitcoin that Americans could privately get their hands on through this platform being enough that the US government just stops investigating and talking and actually does something. And I think this is their we have to do this so that we can definitively show no Americans are on this platform, so kindly fuck off. We're beyond your jurisdiction. And um, yeah, you know, we like almost never mention price or the markets on this show, but that has me bullish as fuck that they are actually scared enough to do this, um, <clears throat> given that they have intentionally refused to do this up until this point, despite all the massive attention and pressure on them. So, yeah. <laughs> uh it's not too early crack a beer and give a cheers the end of an era folks well i mean also they they've made it pretty obvious for quite a long time that they weren't really do doing the basic compliance stuff like their rule about no american citizens or residents was um it was very sloppily enforced because if someone like Tone Vase can be making half of his income from affiliate links where they can literally track the fact that people are signing up through his affiliate links from his content with his name on it and he is obviously American, um, it w th this this doesn't surprise me. Like their their uh, compliance rules were very obviously not uh being enforced so yeah but i'm not an exchange person i don't use exchanges i don't trade so it's like oh another one bites the dust that i will never use well i mean it's kind of like they legit um have 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 incrementally moved forward um you know, I just want to say for all the government agents listening, you know, this is just me talking to my European friends. But they originally would, would require you use a VPN outside of a banned territory to register your account. Um, but then after that, we just not give a fuck where you connected from. <laughs> it's like a year or two where they weren't even doing like IP checks post registration <laughs> it's just like whatever yeah and unfortunately i mean 
if you um, wanted an exchange to respect their user privacy and not give a shit where they're logging in from, that would be a good thing. But unfortunately, due to you government agents, uh, fuck you, by the way, um, you have made it uh, impossible for businesses to respect their users' privacy, even if they actually cared about that. Yep. And it wasn't just laziness. But it's like, you know, this is, uh, <clears throat> yeah, this was going to happen. I mean, I guarantee you it was a tiny, 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 tiny minority um, versus the, the super majority of plebs that constantly get wrecked on 100x. But um, this platform has probably... Um, made an absurd number of just totally off the books millionaires, and uh, yeah, that that was just not going to continue. Like we we were not going to see a run up past the all time high to a new one um, with this exchange <clears throat> still allowing that type of access to leverage and trading products without KYC. Um, either this was going to happen or the hammer dropping was going to happen. Just a sad day. Uh, well, another grain of sand in the vast sea of sand of KYC exchanges that I don't care about. They do produce great research, but I don't give a shit about their exchange. I'm sad. I'm going to be sad for a while. So it's hodl hodl. Also, no Americans allowed, people. Yep. Alrighty, though. Um, next up is the, uh, the micro strategy news that everybody's talking about. Ah. Uh, Not me. <laughs> um, you know, Marty Bent wrote about this, I think, like a week or two ago when MicroStrategy first announced that they intended <clears throat> to take half of their cash reserves and diversify into commodities like Bitcoin and gold and precious metals was how they put it. Well, they went 100% Bitcoin. And... Like, this is just so ridiculously stupid, bullish in terms of price. But this is all so, like, this is like, there is so much positive I want to say about this, but this is going to be the initial domino in market participant makeups changing wildly. Like, this single company bought 21,454 Bitcoin. And the reason they did it explicitly was that this held more appreciation, upside, and less risk than just holding cash as far as just liquid reserves on their balance sheet. Like that is not going to be the last time that we hear of this type of attitude. Like this is going to spread like wildfire through major corporations. The more fucked up the the general economic situation gets as these things keep compounding. And like if you really look at what this company is, they're pretty much a business analytics company. Like they offer services to help businesses look at all of their their data their metrics and make the most intelligent business decisions that they can. One of their customers is the Zurich insurance group. That's the biggest insurance company in Switzerland. <clears throat> MicroStrategy is trusted by that company to provide analytic services to make decisions on how to manage their business. So, <clears throat> this is just going to domino. But really, it's, you know, this is the old boys club coming in at this point. 
like th- these guys are not cypherpunks. They're not getting into Bitcoin um, because they want crypto anarchy to flourish through the world because they want a payment system that is completely impossible to censor. They, they're just putting this on their balance sheet because they are so freaked out over the general macroeconomic situation that they would rather have this on their balance sheet than the reserve fiat currency of the world. So like they're not going to come in here and just be Bitcoiners. They're not going to want to accomplish the types of things most people listening to this are going to want to accomplish. They're not here to break governments. They're just here so that they don't lose their ass and their company doesn't go bankrupt. And so despite how insanely massively bullish this is for the the price and just general market fundamentals, like that's something to keep in mind. These guys aren't going to snap their fingers, have Bitcoin in their hand, and then start espousing the the philosophy of of cypherpunks and quoting Satoshi. That's not how this is going to go. So, you know, everybody who's listening hopefully has some amount of Bitcoin and some part of your brain is screaming, fuck yes, fuck yes, fuck yes, uh, we are going to the moon. But, you know, don't let that voice drown out the other one that's thinking through the consequences of what the fundamentals of this market look like when we have all the players shuffle and a fuck ton of people like this come to the table. Macro strategy, not micro strategy. I mean, it's like, it's fucking exciting as shit. And it is so vindicating just in terms of, you know, someone espousing the thesis of how superior Bitcoin is as a scarce asset, filling this type of, of role in an economy but you know you scale up a order of magnitude and everything changes by an order of magnitude yeah but shinobi don't you know that the next big thing is chain link according to the <laughs> winklevi we're all missing out on the next big thing that is link who the fuck knows what that is of some stupid cross-chain oracle scam nonsense. I don't know. That's about as far as I read before I went. I I don't even care. Link is the new ripple. The linkening. The rippling. Whatever. Mm-hmm. But you know what I mean? This is a... Uh... When this starts dominoing, Bitcoin is going to start mooning like you've never seen before but it's also going to get way harsher and more frantic reactions out of governments who have probably been quietly terrified of exactly this type of thing happening for years so something to keep in mind all right janine um what do we have next that is very depressing looking Well, in March, there had been a guidance notice out of BaFin, which stands for, this is a mouthful, Bundesanstalt für Finanzdienstleistungsaufsicht, the Federal Financial Supervisory Authority in Germany, regarding crypto custody businesses under the German Banking Act, otherwise known as credits. And shortly thereafter, they also put out out a public notice, KKTUG, uh, the Polish company that runs the shitcoins club, Bitcoin ATMs in Germany. Um, I should point out, yes, despite the fact that it's called Shits Club, they mainly uh, allow you to buy and sell um, Bitcoin, I think Ethereum, Ether, and maybe Litecoin. It's basically Bitcoin and like two others, so it's not a lot of coins, um, mostly Bitcoin, but 
It's a Polish company. Um, they op- they did operate in Germany and other European countries, and they now have uh, ceased to operate in Germany, at least publicly. Um, in the guidance that was published back in March, the Boffin said cryptocurrencies are financial instruments pursuant to Section 1. Uh, number 10 is a bit notation of the German Banking Act. The company is thus conducting proprietary trading within the meaning of Section 1, 1A, Sentence 2, Number 4, blah, 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 on a commercial basis without the authorization required under Section 32. It is therefore conducting unauthorized business. Um, and then towards the end of July, there was actually an article in Handel's Blatt, um, which I'm not sure where they're based, but this was being written out of Frankfurt. And so despite the demand to cease operating, the article basically said, hey, there's an ATM that's still up and running in Frankfurt. Um, and I'm not sure exactly when this took place, but it must have happened within the last two or three weeks beca- and might have even been triggered by that article because it's since been reported that those ATMs, I think there were 17 of them in Germany, um, they have now been seized by the government. Um, as the financial regulator now says that ATMs require a banking license to operate. Um, it's a bit unclear, though. I would have to check because, you know, there's always been this kind of gray area between ATM, so-called ATMs that are actually just vending machines for Bitcoin where you can only buy Bitcoin. And they, in, in usually... Um, in a lot of countries, they look at those machines differently than the ones that allow you to do buy and sell because that's more of like, you know, you actually trade it. It's not like a vending machine. So it's a bit confusing as to whether all ATMs are now falling fall, uh, falling under this category and they have to have a banking license or if this is just the ones that allow for buying and selling. Um, so I would have to check out. 17 out of the 60-something ATMs in Germany are... Uh, now gone. <sighs> well, that's kind of exactly the flip side of the micro strategy news I was talking about to kind of draw an analog. Um, you know, Germany was ahead of the U.S. in terms of clearing banks to custody Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And... Would you call it a coincidence that shortly thereafter this interpretation regarding Bitcoin ATMs occurs? Um, You know, maybe opening the door for that to just be another service completely KYC'd up the ass through the banks? Yeah, like like I said, it's a bit unclear. Like I haven't I haven't gone to see if the ATMs that I've seen in Germany are still up and running, but um, like I said, this is only affecting 17 out of the 67 known ATMs in Germany. So the 40 something remaining, um, could, or 50 something remaining could still be up and running. It's just that this company in particular has been continuing to operate despite being told not to. So don't know. Yeah. But I mean, if, That becomes a game of cat and mouse. And then even if it only applies to two-way ATMs and you can still do one-way ones, I mean, that's still kind of a restrictive thing. You know what I mean? People, you know what I mean? Like if you're looking at Bitcoin as a total normie and you're getting this to kind of preserve some of your wealth, I mean, presumably at some point, you're going to want a way to get that back out to use it. I mean, like, I I don't see for a long time normies just, you know, grabbing a little Bitcoin in an ATM and then a year later they're a maximalist that's never spending. Like, no, they're going to want to get dollars out again as long as those are still a usable thing and use that. So... You know, even just limiting things to buy only ATMs, um, if banks were to offer two way ones, that's a huge incentive to go use the banks. Like, I want to know where I can actually get dollars out again, 
not just go to this one way thing and then have another adventure to figure out if I need that money. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I would say that the big difference, like the reason, I mean, yes, I wish there were more ATMs, but at the end of the day, Germany is still a predominantly cash based country. So I suspect that even if all of the ATMs went away, you just you just have people meeting each other informally because they, especially now with the pandemic, a lot of Germans have taken out either gold or cash um, from the bank, or they already had that um, in their hands. And so I assume it would just go to hand to hand, peer to peer cash trades for Bitcoin. Yeah, but you see the kind of point I'm making is you you create a squeeze and you distort the incentives because it would be one thing if those types of things were the only option. Then yeah, every everybody would just use them, normies included. But when the bank offers a nice simple option, you just walk up to check your ID and then ding. Um I feel like that's where a lot of normies would just go. I mean, it's just less friction, less of a weird fringe thing. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, I guess I don't I don't know how people would react to that offer. Um I just I just feel like compared to the US where it's like in the US I have never since I was looking at ATMs since uh like 2015 2016 i have not found a single atm in the u.s that doesn't do kyc even for extremely small amounts so like the the situation in the u.s for germany and other surrounding european countries seems very different to me because like just because you can't um do a no kyc atm in germany uh you can just go to a neighboring country uh, where there are plenty of them, and it's not that hard to get there because there are trains, unlike the U.S., where you have to drive everywhere, and it's insane. Um, so I feel like, yes, shutting down these ATMs is annoying because it just means there's fewer of them, so you have to, you know, probably travel farther to find them. Of the day, it's like the ATM situation in Europe is not terrible, whereas in the U.S., I think it is. I mean, there's still non KYC ones, but it's like you know, I just not like, publicly look at advertised. People who who smoke weed, like it's still illegal in half the U.S. It's legal in a little less than the other half. You know, you're gonna get it one way or another if you smoke. But the instant those government sanctioned legal stores go up, um, it's where everyone goes. And it's just that kind of dynamic. You know what I mean? If you if there's a thing you want to do for a reason and the government shapes the environment in a way where you have this choice to go out of your way, probably pay premiums, deal with weird things, that's a giant pain in the ass, or you just walk into the government-approved thing and just clip-clap, you're out. Yep, just uh, walk into the government-sanctioned, it's a trap. Well, I mean, these, these are the kinds of things, you know, everybody should be worried about during this market cycle. Um, you know, exponential growth, um, it's not going to last forever, but while it does, each jump up is going to have major substantial changes to who is in this ecosystem why people are coming into the ecosystem in the first place. Um, like incentives are just going to change as everything grows. Speaking of privacy and incentives. Ha 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 ha. So this I'm going to just kind of keep short and sweet and high level um, because we are going to probably try to get uh, Chris back onto the show again real soon. But um, 
Chris Belcher um, published an actual protocol specification um, so far for his coin swap design. Um, and so specifically, like this is actually um, a spec out of how to handle minor fees and how that works out. And so pretty much he is looking at some um, actual data from join market where they left, uh, you know, how much of a minor fee the makers would pay as a configurable option. And it just pretty much organically trended to zero because they're there to make money. Um, and all of the miners fees shifted to takers in join market. And so he's looking at a spec where all of the fees would be incurred essentially um, by the taker, the person actually trying to do the routed coin swap. And you would effectively have, um, you know, the output that say Alice is putting in for a coin swap include the fees that would be passed down all the way um, to all the makers involved in a route and effectively just kind of shave that off in amounts um, the same way you would a lightning fee. Um, so from here, um, one thing that kind of popped out in my head um, with the taker involved in that is that fee rates um, effectively become a fingerprint. So if I was to do a coin swap and in all of the, the fees for every hop along the way, um, I include the exact same fee rate, that ridiculously shrinks the anonymity set because you can effectively just look now at everything, um, you know, in a block or in a set of blocks with the exact same fee rates and reduce the, you know, input output set that you're trying to amount correlate uh, drastically through that. So I think a huge important thing here is that 100% of the time, um, different hops along the, the coin swap route randomize or, or tweak the, the fee rate so that you don't kind of shoot yourself in the foot there temporarily. Um, he also specs out the um, structure, um, like he said in the special edition uh, we did with him. He's going to just start off with kind of a naive two of two uh, multi-sig. And then once the, the incentives and the interactions are worked out, incorporate the ECDSA uh, multi-party computation stuff. And he's also kind of broken through... Um, in like a simple algebra formula, kind of the fee structure um, that the taker would incur. So just kind of a table where it breaks down the coins that the taker would start with and then shows all the mining fees subtracted, who is gaining or losing fees for the, um, the maker fee for the coin swap itself. And then pretty much has specced out a protocol um, for the actual handshake and transaction signing. And in the example here, it would be um, a 16 step protocol effectively with um, two makers and the taker participating in it. So um, that would effectively grow in terms of every time you add a new maker, you're extending both the, the funding step and the actual um, completion step in terms of the hash lock pre-image exchange. Um, and then not going to get into this in depth because this is pretty long and complicated, but he's also um, broken down um, kind of referencing the um, entire coordination protocol, both a table of at every single step of that, um, how an abort from a, a coin swap would go. And then also um, what reactions would be taken at every step if somebody kind of misbehaves and rather than just freezing in the protocol, like actively um, acts outside of the protocol or maliciously. Uh, yeah, um, this is a pretty solid starting point actually in terms of detailed implementation specs. And uh, I'm looking forward to having him back on again. All right, are we ready for a random little funny thing that I just I just slipped in here to call somebody stupid? Yes, I am very curious what this is because I haven't looked. 
Okay, so um, Mike Brooks, um, who I have never heard of before, um, just spammed up on the the mailing list and opcode proposal. I just kind of saw uh, when I was looking at Belcher's um, spec write up for the implementation, and oh my god, is this so stupid? And the 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 funny thing here is um apparently um this dude has just been like randomly spamming um all over the place for like almost a year now um <laughs> trying to go look at this op code let's do this so um pretty much the idea is um imagine the whole blockchain you have each transaction in its index spot um, in the block. So you could literally break it down Coinbase transaction slot one, slot two, blah, blah, blah. And each of those transactions have the input output indexes. So transaction slot one, output index zero, the first one. And then obviously the blockchain has its own um, you know, block, blah, 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 block, blah, 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 plus one. Okay, so just think about this. And just think about it in terms of public keys. So I want a specific public key in block 500,000 in slot one in output zero. That public key. Well, the idea behind this, this opcode would nodes now... Um, effectively index every public key so a whole new um you know database to index this um ever used in the blockchain in that indexing scheme and then this opcode would allow you instead of um you know actually having the public key in the transaction output it would just have a reference to an index point where some public key has been used before. Um, and this would allow a 37% reduction in transaction size. So, um, the first reason this is stupid, um, pretty obvious, you can't use this opcode for a public key that has never been used before. So this creates a massive insane incentive um, to reuse addresses constantly because it's an instant 37% savings in fees, um, which would just completely distort the incentives of the entire chain in that reusing addresses, destroying privacy and fungibility, um, would result in a massive financial savings. So a lot of people would do it. And then the other fucking funny, stupid part, I didn't even think of this. Uh, a buddy of mine realized this when I was just laughing at it uh, with him. But it also creates a massive incentive to reorganize the blockchain because you could effectively... Um, you know, in a short reorg, um, change the contents of a block. Um, so therefore a public key and, and what public key is in, in what place. And then the signed transaction using this opcode, um, whoopsies, now that's my public key in this index spot. So I'm just going to take your coins now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's like, I have seriously never um seen such an idiotic proposal for a new feature in bitcoin like ever like i think this this literally takes the cake of the stupidest thing i've ever read <laughs> we need a new york agreement to get it through i mean like think about that if you send coins to a reference point like that that's recent enough then I can just remine the chain and put my key in that reference point and reconfirm your transaction that locks it with this stupid opcode. And now I have your coins. They're mine now. <laughs> Fun.
It sounds like something Jeff Garzik would build. Ah, oh boy. It's just so stupid. So fucking stupid. All right, you know, uh, got some laughs in. Um, yeah, th this one is, I'm still not sure I've even really fully incorporated how bad the fallout from this could be. Yeah, I'm not sure either, but um, I don't know if it's pronounced Mitchell or Michel, like kind of like the French way of saying Michelle, but Michel, Michel Baker, uh, the executive chairwoman and CEO of the Mozilla Foundation and Mozilla Corporation, which is a subsidiary of the foundation, announced that the corporation would be going through significant restructuring, her words, uh, which includes a significant reduction in our workforce by approximately 250 people. Uh, she writes, our pre-COVID plan for 2020 included a great deal of change already, building a better internet by creating new kinds of value in Firefox, investing in innovation and creating new products, and adjusting our finances to ensure stability over the long term. Economic resulting from the global pandemic have significantly impacted our revenue. As a result, our pre-COVID plan was no longer workable, though we've been talking openly with our employees about the need for change, including the likelihood of layoffs since the spring. It was no easier today when these changes became real. I desperately wish that there was some other way to set Mozilla up for success in building a better internet. Um, and, I mean, that last sentence is kind of weird because actually the announcement includes a list of ways that they are planning to build Mozilla up for long-term success, including, I guess, getting more commercial products into the market and things like that, and not purely operating in the freemium model. Um, of course, a lot of people aren't too happy about the announcement because there was no mention of cuts being made to executive pay, which if you know anything about Mozilla, you or if you don't know anything about Mozilla, you may be surprised to learn that, that executive pay in Mozilla is quite high. Um, while that would not solve the problem entirely, um, they would probably have still laid people off, but they could have at least afforded to maybe keep their security team, for example. Um, Catalin Simpanu from ZDNet reported that after firing another 70 employees in January, it appears that the Mozilla Corporation has now fired about a third. Uh, I think his article actually said a quarter, so it's somewhere between a quarter and a third of their entire staff. Last employee stats are from 2018 when the org said it had around 1,000 employees. Um, and then he said, got an update on the Mozilla layoffs Per sources, most of the people who were laid off worked in the servo teams and Mozilla's threat management division, i.e. the security team that does IR and SIEM. SIEM. Uh, IR stands for Incident Response and CM stands for Security Information and Event Management. Yeah, not really great that security people were cut, given, you know, browsers not being so great about security most of the time. Uh, but at least according to an internal email that was sent out to the people who were laid off, um, they it sounds like they are at least getting a nice severance. Uh, it says at least equivalent to full base pay through December 31st, 2020. Um, that is a lot more money than a lot of people are probably getting as they are losing their jobs lately. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this is... <sighs> You know, like if 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 this continues to snowball or is just a, a first step in a lot of compounding financial problems coming home to roost, you know, that could get bad. Like if it became not possible to continue maintaining Firefox and the web engine it's built on, um then you pretty much just have Chrome, um or Chromium rather and everything is just worked off of that so like i mean that would really like even microsoft killed their edge browser and is now moving towards a fork of chrome 
like that would leave a browser monoculture for the most part. Don't forget good old browser. But I mean, it's, you know, like there, Mozilla really is like one of the more important, like open source pieces of software out there in terms of Firefox. And, you know, it's really like they've, you know, I mean, like they, they tried the entire Firefox uh, mobile OS system and they pretty much just had to blackball that um, before it really even got out of beta just because of all the costs. And, you know, it's, I just like, I don't know, it's really digging into the details, um, the degree I did, like, you know, the browser is still there and maintained, um, you know, even though they cut some of their, like, augmented reality engines, um, they're still working on Mozilla hubs, um, I think, and want to push that forward. But you know what I mean? This, it's really like we move into augmented reality, virtual reality, really exploding and getting big. And it's like Facebook and like one or two other companies. Like, you know what I mean? That That is a whole new layer of the internet being built out. And if Mozilla tanks in a year or two, um, they're really the only ones I know of really working on the open source like platform for that or layer for that. Everything else is just giant like corporate closed gardens. And so it's like, you know, you look at that aspect of it and just the way that browser distribution played out, like that would be creating an almost instant monoculture in terms of browsers now and that would torpedo the only really open you know vr platform like really open that i see anywhere yeah and for anyone wondering like why why was mozilla affected by covid like they're once again, it's an internet company, and they have staff all over the place. They should be able to handle remote working, and probably a lot of what they do is remote. Um, apparently, the re I haven't seen this confirmed, but a lot of people are saying that the reason is that, I guess, advertising revenue has dried up over the last couple of months, which I don't... I mean... I mean, look, there's a lot more people who are working from home now who are going to easily get distracted while they're working because they're not used to disciplining themselves when it comes to working online remotely and constantly having opportunities to be distracted. So I'm kind of surprised by this argument that advertising revenue has dried up unless it's the part of advertising revenue which is actually based on, oh, look, people clicking on things and actually buying them and not just clicking on them. Um, or companies cutting spending. Yes, that could be it. So I, I don't know exactly the details of that, but basically a lot of people are saying that the reason they haven't uh, been functioning well is because advertising revenue dried up and also they have this um, funding deal with Google, funnily enough, because we're talking about brother monoculture. Um, they, they get money from Google and I guess Google hasn't renewed that arrangement yet for the next year. So I guess that could have scared them or something, but yeah. Actually, um, I think I think they just did like yesterday or the day before. Uh, okay. I think. Well, then I guess it wasn't enough for them to either it came too late or it wasn't enough for them to change their mind about laying people off. But yeah, people advertising revenue is a shaky business besides the ethics of advertising and the advertising surveillance model of the internet. Um, yeah, not sustainable. It's going to have to change. And unfortunately, I guess the drop in advertising revenue has lost 250 people their jobs. Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody is obsessed with the idea of micropayments for content creators. 
you know, maybe it's time to start really thinking through a private scalable way for like software tool creators. You know what I mean? Does Mozilla accept Bitcoin? Because if they don't, you know, would be a good time to open a donation address. Mm hmm. But it's just, you know what I mean? This. If open companies like that can't survive or find viable monetization methods, then open tools like that are just going to get completely eaten up by corporate alternatives. And like, I don't think any of the listeners need an in-depth rant on why that's probably going to go in a bad direction. So, are you ready to be slightly confused along with me? Wait, I just want to note that I found the oh, yes. donation page for Mozilla that takes Bitcoin since October 2019. Yes. Oh, but God damn it, they use BitPay. <laughs> Dead. God damn it. <sighs> well, um, hey guys, maybe it's this can maybe it's time to get a campaign up and running to get Mozilla to start using BTC pay server like we did with the Tor project. Yep. I think that's uh that's absolutely called for. Get on it after the show is done. Alrighty though. Back to being slightly confused, like I am. So, um, Avanti Bank from Wyoming has announced that they are going to be issuing um, their own token, the Avit, on Liquid. And here's where things start getting confusing. Um, so it is a stable coin, but it's not a stable coin. It's not like pegged to the dollar. Um, and I really have no clue what any of this means. Um, because Caitlin and the other people at Avanti are being completely tight lipped about what actual law and regulation, um, they're issuing this under because they have a patent pending for it, but pretty much, um, what they're claiming is that this would actually be considered or interpreted a as a cash equivalent, um, under IRS regulations rather than property, which is what other stable coins are. And um, kind of remove the headache of capital gains and property like accounting um, on a business's books and so on. But that it would not be outright pegged to the dollar. And that effectively um, their aim is to back this with federal reserve deposits and u.s treasuries um and try to establish a kind of liquid um platform where you could exchange it for the dollar and you know pretty much this like really seems to me like a reinvention of straight up wildcat banking um this seems like they have probably found some legal loophole or category um, to just straight up issue um, their own like free floating currency. Um, and initially they're going to build this out on liquid um, with plans to move to Ethereum um, versions of this as well as other platforms that they say show market demand. Um, but they are going to comply with the Banking Secrecy Act, um, which requires their involvement and collection of um, information. And really the only way I can see that working technologically on Liquid is Blockstream, um, I forgot what the hell it's called, um, Securities Tools, I think, but it's, it's pretty much a platform um, for securities issuers who have to assure compliance with a lot of things where you issue a security into a multi-sig with the issuer so that they effectively become a default 2FA on every transaction conducted with that asset and kind of keep it in that little walled garden. Um, 
so I really can't think of anything but applying that system to this that would allow Avanti to see all the financial details of a transaction um, with this while still getting the you know the benefit of CT keeping things um, private from the public but um, as far as the actual you know statutes that this would be issued under um, your guys guess is as good as mine but this just really looking at everything and mulling over in my head that this just shrieks wildcat banking to me like they just want an asset that is going to you know retain a legal claim on something as far as the holders part um that can be used in transactional cases without the capital gains and property accounting headache of assets like Bitcoin. And um, yeah, if they actually pull this off, um, I see a lot more financial institutions um, looking about launching those types of products. My brain is still trying to figure out how this could be relevant to me. Well, I mean, you buy things, right? <laughs> I guess. I don't think I will buy this. I mean, I think it's... You know, if you really... Really think about it. I mean, like, this... Is the seeds of exactly the type of shit that Hal Finney and many early Bitcoiners were talking about. Um private bank issued currencies um and you know like they they say their plans now um and i'm guessing just to having to do with um exactly how this is being issued as far as what laws it's under um to back it with treasuries and fed deposits but i mean there's really no reason you couldn't back it with bitcoin too and I mean, half of the, the reason that Avanti is there is to have banking services that can actually interact with the maximal property right protections of their users. I mean, I think that we really are seeing the first attempt here at moving in the direction that Hal Finney laid out. You know, and it kind of be a snide dick. I mean, folks. There have always been competing visions of Bitcoin and how it was going to scale and work. And you know what? Everybody's out there still trying to build their own vision. Ah, boy. And I guess just real quick. Um, Feds. Yep. So, uh, Fed Board Governor Lael Brainard... Um, outright uh, said that the Federal Reserve has been for the past couple years um, privately studying um, central bank digital currencies and the Boo. outdated meme word distributed ledger technologies. Boo. And um, yeah, um, it's which branch? Was it? I think the Boston Federal Reserve branch has been... Um, collaborating with MIT on this. And it's really, um, you know, to kind of tie back to the Avanti stuff, um, w you know, it's pretty common sense what happens if the Fed just gives everybody a direct consumer facing account um, at the Federal Reserve, which is effectively what a CBDC is. Um, private banks just become completely irrelevant and they implode on themselves. So, you know, the only real practical way without setting off that implosion of the economic sector would be to limit a central bank digital currency to just use by those types of um, private institutions. And so, you know, just as much as I'm pondering, um, the idea of a, a bink in the Hal Finney sense uh, with what Avanti is doing, um, those Fed deposits or treasuries 
that they are planning on backing the Abbott with um, could just as easily in the next couple of years wind up being some token on FedCoin chain um, that only mm. institutions like that have access to. So, uh, yeah. Ecoin is coming, guys, one way or the other. Where is it coming from? Which corner? Which thing? It's going to be one of them. It's already here in the form of Facebook credits. <laughs> Facebook is the Fed in disguise. Well, we can clearly see with all the Libra nonsense from last year, they want to be one. <laughs> you can tell by Mark Zuckerberg's... Uh, <laughs> I almost said hyper white. <laughs> I'm, all the blood that has drained out of Mark Zuckerberg's face is proof. See? Alrighty. So what new issue is making the rounds? Hmm? Yeah, it's not really a new issue at all in any way, but people are noticing it now, so might as well bring it up um i mean the only new part is kind of what kinds of websites they're targeting or services but a security researcher and tor server operator known as uh Nusinu, i have no idea how to pronounce that but he pub he or they published the first part of a report titled how malicious tor relays are exploiting users in 2020 and they claim to have uncovered a malicious actor who's been running more than 23% of the entire Tor network's exit capacity. And that attacker specifically targeted cryptocurrency-related websites, namely uh, multiple Bitcoin mixer services. Uh, and in their report, it says they replace Bitcoin addresses and HTTP traffic to redirect transactions to their wallets instead of the user-provided Bitcoin address. Bitcoin address rewriting attacks are not new, but the scale of their operations is. Um, and then I think they also noted that now it's they're estimating that the attacker controls about 10% compared to 20% because the directory authorities have been trying to clamp down on whoever this person or group is that's doing this. Uh, so it's now around 10%, they think. And so basically the attack, um, as they explain it, is basically them engaging in selective SFL stripping, which is basically just removing the S from HTTPS and um, getting the unencrypted HTTP traffic because a lot of websites do not use established countermeasures like HSTS preloading and HTTPS everywhere. Um, well, HTTPS everywhere is a thing also on the user side that you should have as a browser extension if you don't already, because that basically forces the websites you go to to use the HTTPS version, even if they don't normally default. Um, um, and so that's what makes this attack possible. And it should be noted that this is not specific to the Tor browser. This is something that can happen in any browser. It's just that they're using the Tor network as a way to also kind of obfuscate the fact that they're doing this, but it's not it's not a Tor specific vulnerability. Um, but uh, malicious relays, uh, I think this is also a quote. Malicious relays are just used to gain access to user traffic. Um, Nusanu did not report which mixing services were targeted and how much, if any, Bitcoin was hijacked this way. So we literally don't know whether. Um, whether anyone has actually been the victim of this attack or whether it's just been attempted. And another thing to note is that so far we don't even, like, we don't know which mixing services this was targeted against, but we do know that at least some of the big ones like Wasabi, um, has not been affected. They published a long blog post explaining in detail why these kinds of replacement attacks are not possible due to various things that Wasabi does, including um, they don't rely on Tor exit nodes and everything is HTTPS, lo lots of things. So not possible with Wasabi. Um, not a mixing service, but the fully noted project also said that they were not affected due to how they're architected. Um, so the best guess is that the mixing services being referenced here uh, are probably dark market 
darknet market mixers because um, obviously it would uh, be far less likely for a user who was using a darknet mixer to, uh, you know, go to people and say, hey, I've been the victim of this attack. Um, so anyway, don't know how many people were affected, whether any Bitcoin was lost through this, but um, also ZDNet noted that a similar type of attack had been performed in 2018, and also uh, Hacker Factor, or Dr. Neil Krawitz on Twitter, um, noted that a similar attack with TSL hijacking was noticed in 2009 and 2014. So yeah, this is not a new thing, it's just the target of the attack is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just like explicitly, like anything that's connecting to a native Tor service, like something that never leaves the Tor network or goes out into the clear net on the other end, like you, you should be fine. Like that's that should not be an issue if the the service is set up properly. Yeah, because for anyone who doesn't know how Tor works, the whole point of an exit node is when you are exiting the Tor network and you are going to something that's on the clear net, but you're still remaining anonymous. Um, but obviously that gives exit nodes uh, simultaneously a lot of power if you're doing something wrong or the website isn't enforcing SSL. Uh, but it can also be the reason why a lot of people don't run exit nodes because law enforcement tend to target people who run exit nodes because when they're looking at the traffic, it looks like that exit node is doing all the naughty business. Um, so yeah, that's why there's also not a lot of exit nodes, but if you're a, another <laughs> good reason why you should, uh, listen to my whole, uh, campaign to get Bitcoin related websites to advertise their hidden service and to actually use hidden services, because that will solve mm -hmm. a big part of this problem. If you enable onion location on your hidden service so that people who go to your website can find your hidden service, then a lot more people will stay in the Tor network and not have to deal with this shit. Here, here. Now to go to something that is the opposite of privacy. Yeah, so Coinbase is doing uh, fiat loans against crypto collateral. And honestly, I am amazed at this point that it took this long. So um, in eligible states, um, starting, I think, in a month? Let's... Um, okay, it's just a wait list with no date. Um, can borrow up to 30% um, of the fiat value of their Bitcoin holdings. So yeah, uh, Coinbase is now um, a BlockFly clone. And yeah. Well, they're, they're not a true BlockFi clone until they hire someone who is former Palantir, former Defense Intelligence, former FBI, and what's the other one? Former Department of Defense. I think I got all four <laughs> agencies. Like, honestly, um, this would probably not bother me. Um, being Coinbase um, any more than any other business doing it. Um, if we did not have so much experience with how greasy and shady and underhanded Coinbase is, because, uh, you know, if you go to BlockFi or something like that, you know, you know what you're doing here. Like, here's this, um, lend it out and give me interest and maybe give me a loan. Um, Coinbase is super normie land. Um, and yeah, I just cannot see this going any other way than the exact same kind of shit they did with the get paid in crypto to learn about crypto shit. Um, I predict just a bunch of dark flows in their site and their app constantly spamming this in fucking people's faces um 
who have no idea how this market works, uh, how volatile it can get, um, you know, don't really have any kind of intuition or understanding of this type of financial shit and just trying to drag them into taking loans out so that they can charge interest and oopsies, the price crash. Sorry, you got liquidated or like, you know what I mean? It's, I just can't see them doing anything but being super greasy to just try to push as many clueless normies as possible into using this. What are loans backed by? Did you already say? The Bitcoin. Like specifically? No, oh, Bitcoin. So yeah, not... so like if the price crashed, so it's like the exact same kind of uh, like oh, it's an over collateralized loan. And if the price crashes um, enough, you're going to get liquidated and you're going to lose all of your Bitcoin. And um, yeah, like. So it's I, not backed by like Link or the next big thing or something? No, although just wait until they start opening it up. Um, <laughs> is it backed? Is it backed by daddy? It's backed by your Bitcoin that you didn't want to sell. So you just took out this loan because, come on, hey, don't you want to have some money to spend without having to sell your Bitcoin? Oops, I'm sorry. The market crashed. What Bitcoin? It's gone. I mean, yeah, it's a smart, potentially maybe smart move on their part because they will have the Bitcoin. <laughs> they have full control in this situation. It's just, I, I just don't see them like doing this um, without getting greasy with it. And like I, I'm just waiting as this rolls out to start seeing the signs of that. I mean, this is the same exchange that wasn't it, wasn't it declared recently that they don't have a responsibility to give their users fork coins? Like how, why would, why would you trust them to, uh, why would you trust them to actually uh, care about you when they're, you know, doing this loan business? Because some people are clueless and think that numbers in their Coinbase app means that they have their own Bitcoin. It's just, yeah. Um, I'm just waiting for the tears to start from that one. Have daddy clean it up. Oh. Yes, yes, Caso, loan from daddy. Let's do that. So many loans from daddy. All right. So I feel like Fully Noted literally keeps dropping like a new fucking update like every fucking week <laughs> at this point. But um, they just dropped version 0.1.68. Um which updated the PSBT signing um, to be compatible with the newest um, mini update to Bitcoin Core. Um, some multi-sig um, fixes and improvements, SATs denomination, and C Lightning um, support. So you can now spin up um, a C Lightning instance uh, on the same device with your node. And there is a convenient little plugin by uh, Start Nine Labs. Um, you just hook that up to Sea Lightning, and whammo bammo, um, your fully noted wallet can now integrate with Lightning too. Um, so yeah. Um, aside from, I don't know, you could argue Liquid. Um, this is a full Bitcoin stack like app that's fully validated hooked up to your own node with psbt support multi-sig support cold card support general psbt support again lightning support like this is the single best fucking piece of software bitcoin related anywhere in apple's ecosystem like period and it's fucking stupid because at this point, like, where's where's my Android version? Where's that? I want this on fucking Android. How the hell did this guy take? He just completely inverted, like the the state of things. 
iOS sucked. Android had everything. Like, when my Android version, I demand it. Re Strike, you're out. So this one, uh, real fun. Um, Strike next week is uh, launching cash back uh, on payments. And the funniest thing um, about this to me is everybody in the comments screaming, how do you make money? How do you make money? Like, how do you do this? How do you make money? Um, like the entire business necessitates like trading nonstop, um, to hedge risk and offers a million opportunities to make money like that. And, um, yeah, this is just pretty fucking awesome to see them so quickly roll that back. Um, you know, I'm assuming they've been doing really well, uh, into cash back to the actual users. <laughs> um, Let's just say I would not want to be um, the accountant for Strike because that just terrifies me even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah. I'm sure the accountant is more than half robot by now. Very likely. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, just... Oh, really the only thing I can think to say besides lol, that's how he's making money, is um you know when we had him on here, like even he like described Strike himself as like a, a neo bank that was powered on Bitcoin rails. You know what I mean? And it's this this is becoming a theme in the space lately, if you're looking around in terms of different like ways of doing that, of being a Bitcoin bank. Like you have retarded, dumb nonsense, like fucking Coinbase and BitPay. Um, you have Avanti and whatever interesting thing that you may or may not like they're doing over there. And you have things like Strike. And, you know, this is going to be a very Darwinistic five or ten years where you have a lot of different variations and, um, you know, setups like that in terms of Bitcoin banks. And I do want to slap on in the end there. Um, Coinbase and BitPay recently um, did a, a stupid fucking deal so that you can just pay off chain um, BitPay invoices directly out of your uh, your Coinbase account. Um so yeah, fuck um, that greasy ass um, way of trying to do that. I do want to point out that I'm still waiting for Strike to update their privacy policy. And their website. And just their marketing in general. Don't yell at Jack. But I said I wouldn't yell. Well then go lambaste him, I don't know. I, I personally prefer yelling. Well, he uh, when he was on the celebratory 250th episode for what Bitcoin did, he did say that he thought privacy needs more support. So give it more support by updating your privacy policy, Jack. <laughs> Zing. All right. Ribbing aside, though, I think uh, that puts us into final thoughts. I have a few. My final thoughts are mostly just clever tweets that I've seen <laughs> over the past couple of weeks. Uh, the first one is the word anarchist was deliberately semantically pushed to mean bomb thrower because five dudes died in anarchist bombings around the year 1900. Meanwhile, liberals and conservatives have bombed millions of people, but it's okay because they sign the proper forms. Well, you have to sign the proper forms. You'll get in trouble. Yep, it makes the difference between collateral damage and collateral murder. Exactly. We we have a process. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, that that word is I think done uh, for a while without that association. I think the last couple months in America kind of sealed the deal on that one. 
Well, speaking of which, of uh, people who misinterpret the word anarchist, uh, another one is, would be good if more U.S., <laughs> I don't know what U.S. Americans, it should probably just be Americans, but would be good if more Americans viewed the presidential election the way the rest of the world does, as a contest to decide who will run the most powerful killing machine in the history of humanity. <laughs> chad oh and my, my favorite um i don't know what the hell is going on with this yam thing so i concur with peter Woola's comment on twitter yeah two days ago where he said why do people care about random nonsense that Im nonsense that implodes i haven't ever heard of yam before today I still don't know what Yam is. The The one tweet that I saw that kind of gave me an idea is that it's some kind of Ethereum-based farmville where you, where you harvest yams. I have no idea if that's correct, but that's the image I have in my head, and I don't care to update it. <laughs> no, it's better. It's a runaway smart contract that had a bug that kept dumping... Um you know, tokens into a treasury address controlled by the smart contract and the whole smart contract was controlled by voting. So when the treasury address got too full, nobody can ever vote again and it's just runaway hyperinflationary yam time. <laughs> My last final thought, um... Well, I could make a final thought just about the fact that Julian Assange had another hearing yesterday, and once again, it was a disaster because despite the fact that the U.S. government has basically rescinded their uh, extradition request and tried to place it with a new one, he has not been rearrested under that new extradition request. So he's literally now sitting in a maximum security prison, having not been arrested under an extradition request that is active. Um, so that's a bit disgusting. But also, um, just to get across, you know, how close some people can get to potentially big scoops, um, Kim Zetter, who's a a national security reporter um, tweeted yesterday that she recently um, asked someone about the worst mistakes they made in their career, got me thinking about mine. Days into my first job as a reporter, a source gave me a used BlackBerry bought on eBay, previously owned by a former Morgan Stanley VP of mergers and acquisitions, still had emails on it. The emails discussed confidential info about loan terms for Morgan Stanley clients, debt restructuring strategies for specific companies, preliminary talks for potential merger deals, and even a discussion about potential dishonesty about a contract. Regarding the latter, an email exchange between two Morgan Stanley employees discussed a client who wanted to sidestep the terms of a contract signed with a third party, and Morgan Stanley advised the company to stay above board and follow the letter of the contract. I didn't have time to review all the emails before writing a story and hope to review more after, um, but Morgan Stanley pressured me to return it even though I had obtained it lawfully. Editor agreed to return. Um, I think this this is a typo. Morgan Stanley sent lawyer to my house after hours to get it. I still regret handing it over today. I was so green as a journalist then, and I've always wished I had stood my ground and refused to return it, but it was a good lesson, and it helped toughen me up to face other companies and governments. Imagine what could have been on that thing. Yep. Uh, and now we shall never know. Pleb. You never give back the, the phone from the company guy. Never. Alright, honestly, um, I don't know. My real only final thought is, uh, a video, um, called What They Don't Want You to See. Um, full disclosure, I have not watched it yet. I was planning on sitting down after, uh, we finished recording here. Um, What They Don't Want You to See, which I have not seen. <laughs> mm-hmm, but, um... This is a uh, documentary um, made by an InfoWars reporter. Oh, no. About. No, 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 no. 
about machine learning um, platforms refining the targeting of propaganda. Um, and is the AI getting turned gay or something? No, no, it's this is a serious thing. Um, By rogue bits, it's the woman who made it is Millie Weaver. And literally, when this um, was launched, um, premiering, um, she was arrested at her home um, on an accusation of one, a petty burglary charge, um, which it, th this is, you know, just a, a mother with her kid there when she was arrested um, and seems on the face total bullshit to me. And the sheriff was also referencing a grand jury indictment of her. Um, he had no paperwork, no arrest warrant or anything with him um, when he came to arrest her at her home. And um, this video had just been released. So, um, you know, Infowars with a grain of salt, but um, I'm going to go watch it. And uh, I suggest you guys do too. A giant grain of salt. A boulder mm. of salt. Not that much. A pillar of salt. Nope. Haha. -ha. But on that note, toodles, punks. Bye. <laughs> Is it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is.